Good morning, North Church. Welcome to this Sunday's broadcast. As you can see, we are not live streaming from the sanctuary, but instead we'll be participating in the first ever conference-wide worship service that is being led by our conference leadership in the bishop. This is a special Sunday in Methodism where we celebrate our heritage in our founder, John Wesley. It's called Aldersgate Sunday, and all of that will be explained in the service. This week, I hope you'll check out our ministries on our website, northchurchindy.com. Next Sunday, we will be back to our regular live stream at 11 a.m. from the sanctuary. But until then, I hope that you are blessed by Bishop Trimble and our conference leadership. is a strange time. Our church buildings are empty. This is not what we planned. Nor is it how we're designed. We miss being together. We're hungry for community. Singing, preaching, face-to-face -face conversation, and human touch. Yet we press on. Because the church is not a building. It is not brick and mortar. The church is the body of Christ and has left the building. Bringing the incarnational love of Jesus Christ to a hurting and hungry world. We are Indiana are United Methodists. We are Indiana 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 United Methodists. And the church is still alive. Hello and welcome to worship. My name is Dr. Elise Fulbright and I serve as your conference superintendent. It is on this Sunday that we celebrate Aldersgate Sunday. It's in this worship expression that we hope the Spirit of God will warm our hearts strangely. Strangely to the ways in which God's grace continues to be extended to us. Warm strangely to the ways in which we continue to spread the love of Jesus Christ. Warm strangely to the ways in which we continue to stretch in our faith. Warm strangely to the ways in which God will continue to use us, no matter our season of life, so that all will come to know who this God is and who Jesus Christ is. For ultimately, we are called to love God, to love our neighbor, and to love ourselves. And so friends, we invite you into this worship experience. May you open your hearts to the ways in which God will move. And oh, we declare, come Holy Spirit, come. Here in this place, new light is streaming. Now is the darkness vanished away. Our fears and our dreams brought here to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now and we shall awaken. Sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old, who yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history, called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty, 
gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly. Give us the courage to enter the soul. Not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light gives away. But here in this place the new light is shining. Now is the kingdom, now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all peoples together. Fire of love in our flesh and our Hi, my name is Dave Neckers, Conference Superintendent of the Northeast District. Why don't you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ, and we thank you and praise you. We worship you. We bless your holy name. You are worthy to be praised. And Lord, as we gather together today, we are so thankful that your Holy Spirit that is with us transcends time and distance. And so, Lord, as we gather together to worship you, we praise you. And not only do we praise you, Lord, we thank you as we wait patiently, patiently for you. And you hear our cries. You hear the cries of those who are lonely, those who are grieving, those who are afraid. And so, Lord, I just trust that your Holy Spirit would come to each and every one of those under the sound of my voice who are feeling those things. And God, that you would touch them and bring healing and bring peace and give them rest. And now, as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught us, won't you join me in the prayer he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My name is Sanita Michael. I'm the conference superintendent for North District of the Indiana Conference. I'm reading from Psalm chapter 130, the version of New International Version. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hello, my name is Ian Hall, and I'm the Director of Administration and Financial Services for the Indiana Conference. During these unprecedented times, I'd like to thank you for your continued financial support of your local United Methodist Church. Your generous support for the life-changing ministries of your local community continues. Food banks are open. Daycare programs are caring for the children of essential workers. Masks are being produced and distributed. Meals are being prepared and delivered. 
virtual ministry, virtual worship, Bible study, and pastoral care continues. In the midst of this unprecedented situation, we've noticed that pastors and lay leaders have been working harder than ever to maintain ministry and care for congregations, and your giving supports their work. As United Methodists, we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Your tithes and offerings do make a difference in your local community and across the globe. The wider connection of United Methodist churches would not be possible without the support of congregations like yours. Once again, thank you for your faithfulness to ministry and to the wider United Methodist Church. Greetings from Emily Reese, your Conference Director of Church Development from my backyard sanctuary in Whitestown, Indiana, just north of Indianapolis. This is our epistle reading for today from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself, by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. reading from Mark chapter 12 beginning with verse 27. He is not the God of the dead but of the living. You are badly mistaken. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God.
John Wesley had been a priest in the Church of England for all of his adult vocational life. But it wasn't going well. Having recently returned from a most unsuccessful adventure in the Americas where the missional purpose that he had hoped to accomplish did not transpire and things had gone painfully sour, he was in a time of despair. The only consolation that he sensed at that particular time in his life came from the companionship of a group of Moravian Christians whom he had come to know on the journey over. It was on the 24th of May in 1738 that John writes in his journal that he went very unwillingly to a society on Aldersgate Street, a gathering of Moravians who were there for a Bible study that night. It was about a quarter of nine, he writes, when one was reading from the Epistle to the Romans, when, Wesley says, I did find my heart strangely warmed, and I knew that I could trust in Christ, Christ alone, to take away my sins, even mine. It seems so understated as we read it on print, and yet what we know is this was the transformative, the conversional moment in John Wesley's life when, in fact, the ministry that he had been about for the entirety of his life actually came to life. It caught fire. And what became the Methodist movement was kindled on that particular moment. The most striking thing about that episode, at least to me, is that he went so unwillingly that night. The most transformative moment in his life came as a result of going someplace he didn't want to go. I look at my own life, and maybe you can relate to this too. So often places I have preferred not to go. When I arrived, I found that Jesus was waiting there for me, and that it became for me one of those pivotal, transitional, conversional moments in my experience. My name is Mitch Gisselman. I am the conference superintendent assigned to the fabulous Southwest District of our Indiana Conference. I'm coming to you from my backyard. You know, as I contemplate this peculiar situation that we're in, this pandemic dilemma that we face, it may well be that we find ourselves in places we would prefer not to. As much as I am at home here in my backyard, it's not where I would choose to be on Sunday morning. And so many of us doing our worship by live stream or YouTube or whatever think to ourselves, if only I could be in church. Whether you are this day where you want to be or not, my prayer for you is that somehow you will experience the warmth of the Spirit's fire. That the same Spirit that brought to life the apostles and gave birth to the church, the same Spirit that warmed the heart of John Wesley and kindled our Methodist movement, will somehow spark a fire in your life that you will look back on this day as a transformative one in your experience. And that you will always remember this as a time when God was uniquely present, even in the most extraordinary of circumstances. Bishop Julius Trimble came to Indiana to lead the United Methodist Church in September of 2016. As our bishop, he's embraced the people of Indiana, he's made Indiana his home, and he's passionately shared his love for Jesus Christ in all corners of our state. 
On a personal note, I've been incredibly blessed to have seen him lead with grace and excitement in our churches and with our pastors as he lives out his desire to that each one of us would be encouraged. So I pray that you will open your hearts today and be encouraged as Bishop Trimble shares his message with us about the great commandment that Jesus taught in the Gospel of Mark. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, for the gift of life and for the gift of salvation, for the gift of church and for the gift of community, we give you thanks and praise for Jesus Christ, for the good news of the gospel, and for the capacity to be compassionate and consistent in our love for one another, and most of all, our love for you, Jesus. Bless us this day in Jesus' name. Dear beloved Christian friends, United Methodists of Indiana, I'm so blessed and pleased and privileged to worship with you this Sunday morning. I want to share for a few moments on the subject, love that shines through. I can remember serving the last church I served before I was elected Bishop. It was Aldersgate United Methodist Church in Ohio. And we were hosting a conference where we had a speaker come in speaking to churches, clergy and laity around church development and how to reach new people in our community. And so since we were hosting it, we thought we would open uh, the, the conference with our praise group singing the welcome song we sang on Sunday mornings. The Jesus and me loves the Jesus and you, and the Jesus and you loves the Jesus and me. It's so easy, so easy, so easy, so easy to love. And so the conference speaker um, took a few moments to make commentary about our welcome song. Uh, he wasn't overly impressed with how contemporary or novel it was, but he did acknowledge that it seemed to work for us. And that was the case. We simply wanted to communicate to those who were coming to worship that the Jesus in us loves the Jesus in you. And I think one of the prayers I've been praying this time as we've been socially distancing, as we experience quarantine as we've experienced anxiety and angst and ambiguity is oh god what would you have us to do how would you have us to live in this moment of history in this liminal space how would you have us to be faithful when we are fearful how would you have us to be generous when many of us are are struggling many of our parishioners are struggling how would you have us to feed the hungry when we can't touch them. And I think we can lean upon one another during this season. In times like these, we pray, oh God, have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us. Aldersgate Sunday, in fact, any Sunday, is a good time to ask the question, what is a disciple who is perfected in love? In his 1742 treatise, The Character of a Methodist, John Wesley acknowledges the limitation of the human condition. Sin is the problem. Salvation in Jesus Christ is the solution. Wesley displays a, a profound optimism in what God's grace can accomplish in the life of any and every child desiring to walk with greater integrity in the way of the gospel. Our faith can not only be a source of strength, but an instrument of healing, even in a moment like this. Our faith is a source of strength, is an instrument of healing, when it is perfected in Christ's love. To be a Methodist, according to Wesley, meant you must love God with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbors as you love yourself. 
It was Wednesday, May the 24th, 1738. John Wesley experienced his heart being strangely warmed. It was not only an important moment for Wesley or for the Wesleys, but it was for the Wesleyan movement and its future to be characterized as a religious movement of head and heart, grace and action, scriptural holiness and social holiness. This was the heartwarming Aldersgate experience. John and Charles Wesley formed a religious holy club at Oxford University. They had not found much vitality or passion or discipline in campus life at Oxford University. So they began to meet for prayer and for scripture reading and for devotion. They were taking Jesus seriously and they didn't see that happening in other places. And the students began to deride them and to jokingly speak about them and call them Methodists because of their methodical way of reading scripture and praying together and caring for one another in community. John and Charles Wesley got it right. In May of 1738, both of these brothers had heartwarming experiences. And even though they had been passionate about the church and the ministry of the church, they did not know Jesus Christ as their personal savior and did not have the assurance of salvation in their faith. They had not accepted Jesus Christ and known the joy and assurance of the faith that comes from accepting him. They had witnessed this deep faith in their Moravian friends when they first came to the American colonies in Georgia. The story is told that the record reads that there was a storm at sea. And in the midst of this storm at sea, when all thought that the ship would sink, the Moravians continued to pray, but did not panic. And after short, what seemed to be a short and unsuccessful trip to America, the Wesleys went back to England, where once again they came under the influence of the Moravian Christians. And it was on Aldersgate, in Aldersgate, London, after hearing the preface to the Episcopal Romans, John Wesley, John Wesley writes these words about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ and Christ alone. I trusted Christ for salvation and assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. You talk about freedom and clarity to know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ has saved you from sin, has forgiven your sins, that loves you beyond description, you talk about freedom. You talk about clarity. You talk about a, a, a deep foundation for faith. The power of the Holy Spirit was at work in Wesley's heart so that he might hear the gospel, they might hear the gospel, and we might experience the gospel in a new way. I want to talk about love that shines through. Love that shines through. The great commandment story is told in the gospel lessons, and this is from Mark, the 12th chapter. First, I'm going to read a little bit from the Common English Bible and then some verses from the Message Bible, Eugene Peterson's. One of the legal experts, verse 28, Mark 12, heard their dispute and saw how well Jesus answered them. And he came over to ask a question which commandment is most important of them all? Jesus replied, you know the answer to this. The most important one, Israel, listen. O oh God is the one Lord. And you must love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your being, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. You will love your neighbor, as yourself. 
No other commandment, no other commandment is greater than these. The legal expert said to Jesus, well said, teacher, you have truthfully said that God is one and there is no other besides him. And to love God with all of our heart, a full understanding and all of one's strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more important than all kinds of entirely burned offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered him with wisdom, Jesus said to him, you aren't far from God's kingdom. And after that, no one dared to ask him any other questions. Eugene Peterson puts it this way, the great commandment. One of the religion scholars came up hearing lively exchanges of questions and answers and seeing how sharp Jesus was in the answers, he put him to this question, which is most important of all commandments? Jesus said, the first is important. Listen, Israel, the Lord your God is one. So love the Lord with all your passion, passion and prayer, intelligence and energy. And here's the second, love others, love others, love others as well as you love yourself. There's no other commandment that ranks with these. The religion scholar said a wonderful answer, teacher, so lucid and accurate that God is one and there is no other and loving him with all passion and intelligence and energy and loving others as well as yourself. Well, that's better than all the offerings. That's better than all the sacrifices put together. When Jesus realized how insightful he was, he said, you are almost there, almost there right on the border of God's kingdom. After that, no one else dared ask a question. So what commandment is the first of all? Jesus answers this and makes it so clear. That hasn't changed based upon the time period we're living in. That hasn't changed. The central confession of Judaism which Jesus shares as a confession of faith for us today to receive as our core commandment. Hear, first of all, hear, the Lord our God is one, the Shema. The Lord our God is one, there is no other. You shall love the Lord your God. This is for us, friends. With all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You've heard it a thousand times. There is no greater commandment than these. Two commandments that actually meant one from Jesus. This central core thing, this central core foundation of your faith is for you to love. Love first the God who created you and love your neighbor who you are privileged to, to live with. No program agenda, no projects are to take precedence. No plans, no prescriptions, no parliamentary procedures. Love. Love God first and love neighbor. But friends, I want us to also remember that we cannot love neighbor in a healthy way. We cannot love God in a healthy way and then neglect ourselves. I want to say to, to my pastors, our pastors, as a colleague, as your bishop, God loves you. I love you. I want to say to our laity, Never be ashamed or apologetic about praying for and encouraging your pastors. Every single pastor came from a congregation. They didn't drop from heaven. They didn't come from a closet in the Episcopal office. Every pastor 
came from a congregation, from a church. Every pastor who's been called by God is equipped by God and sanctioned and certified by the church. And they have been sent to borrow the words from the first lady, my wife, who says it all the time, love the people, love the people, love the people. No program agenda, no project agenda takes precedence. And I believe during this time of a pandemic, it has never been more important than to let the love of God to shine in us and to shine through us. Is there something more important while sheltering in place, while praying for a breakthrough, a turnaround, a cure, a comeback? Mark Sanborn, in his book, How to Succeed When Times Are Up, Down, Good, Bad, or Sideways, he raises this. He says, the greatest challenge as human beings is acting on what we know. Mark Sanborn. This book is entitled, How to Succeed When Times Are Up, Down, Good, Bad, or Sideways. They've been a little bit of all of that. Our greatest challenge may be acting on the very things that we know. There's some things we should do all the time. Paying attention to God. Planting flowers. Praising God, saying I'm sorry, communicating by phone or any other means necessary to let people know that we care. Praising God. And so we sing one of the great hymns of the church, an Aldersgate Sunday hymn, an annual conference hymn, a, a great hymn we sing, a Wesley hymn, Charles Wesley hymn. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Both John and Charles, Charles Wesley, his brother, they both had a passion and zeal that translated into working 15 to 18 hour days. I don't recommend that for our pastors, by the way. And some of you have been working long enough where you need to take a break. I've seen it. So Charles and John Wesley weren't the best examples for self-care of loving themselves, but they got it right on loving God and loving neighbor and having a, a, a religion and a theology that says that others can be more important than our programs and our agenda. They had a passion and zeal that translated into preaching to thousands. They traveled thousands of miles on horseback, conducting as many worship services as possible. Charles Wesley spent much of his time writing hymns. Some say no less than 6,500 hymns, hymn texts. Ken Osbeck, the music historian, says in 1749, on the occasion of Charles Wesley's 11th anniversary of his own Aldersgate conversion experience, wrote the hymn, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. It is believed that Charles Wesley was inspired by a chance remark by Peter Bowler, the Moravian leader who said, if I had a thousand tongues to praise God, that wouldn't be enough. In the United Methodist hymnal, this hymn has seven stanzas. But when Wesley, Charles Wesley first wrote the hymn, it had 19 verses, 19 stanzas. Now we complain if we have to sing all seven. Just imagine if you had to sing 19 stanzas. One of those was, many of those verses were actually about his own testimony of his salvation. One of those was, the Lord's atoning blood close to my soul applied. Me he loved, the Son of God. For me, for me he died. The assurance of knowing that Jesus Christ died for you and for me. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. The love of God poured inside us is the substance of our faith. So I don't have answers about when this pandemic will end. I don't have answers about how can we guarantee uh, uh, safety when we step outside of our homes and gather in our sanctuaries. But I do have an answer about this. 
that the substance of our faith is the love of God poured inside of us. So Bishop, how can I stay centered and remain hopeful, much less joyful when our lives and our way of living has been so disrespectful? disrupted. Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I don't know how I feel when I see so many people hurting and dying. I, I know it doesn't feel good. I don't know how to come up with good answers when people ask questions about the perennial nature of those who are struggling. But by grace, I know this, we mean love that comes to us and love that shines through us. Not in just the words we say, but in the deeds that we do. So I'm always inspired. I'm always inspired by Leslie Bledslow, who's the wife of uh, one of our bishops in the United Methodist Church, Bishop Bledslow from New Mexico and Northwest Texas. She's blind. She's been blind since her 50s, early 50s. And every morning she wakes up, she asks God this question. God, what is my assignment today? So I would encourage you, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you wake up tomorrow morning, ask God, what is my assignment today? And remember the words of the great commandment. There is only one Lord. Love the Lord your God. Not just a little bit, not just a little while, but love the the Lord your God, with all of your soul, with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. A short commandment with a long commitment, a deep commitment. If I had a thousand tongues, I would praise God for being God. I would praise God for loving me. I would praise God for loving you. If I had a thousand tongues, I would praise God for you being the church. I would praise God for pastors and the way in which you've been faithful. I would praise God for church leaders and the way in which you have been supportive and faithful. If I had a thousand tongues, I would praise God for just being God. If I lived in Japan, I would probably say arigato. If I lived in France or the Democratic Republic of, of the Congo, I probably would say merci. If I lived in Nigeria, I might say Nagote. If I lived in Tanzania or Kenya, I might say Asante. If I resided in Germany, I might say Dakacha. If I lived in Brazil, I might say Obrigato. If I was Korean or it was my native language, I might say Come say Hamneda Yesu ni. If I spoke Spanish as my native language, I would say Gracias. Jesus. But since I live in central Indiana and I worship in the north of Indiana and the south of Indiana and the northwest and the, and the east of Indiana, all across this state, I simply say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God, and thank you, Jesus. Thank you, pastors, and thank you, lay leaders. Thank you, churches, for your generosity. Thank you for worshiping faithfully online. Thank you for keeping your social distance. Thank you for feeding the hungry. Thank you for clothing the naked. Thank you for not giving up or giving out or quitting or stopping. Thank you, people. To the doctors, I say thank you. To the nurses, I say thank you. To the trash collector who came by this morning, I say thank you. To the truck drivers, I say thank you. To the church Clerks, I say thank you. To the grocery cashier, I say thank you. To the people that we overlook, the people that we undercount, the people that sometimes we dismiss, I say thank you, God, for showing us that if we love God, we must also love neighbor. And if we love neighbor, we must also love self. So, dear friends, I'm looking for that love that shines through us so that our kindness may become contagious. Our generosity might be outrageous. Our faithfulness might be timeless. And our compassion might be endless. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God bless you. 
Let that love shine through. Amen. It's said that Charles Wesley wrote over 8,000 hymns in the course of his lifetime, but perhaps the most popular of all is the one found first in our United Methodist hymnal, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. I was in my 50s before I understood the, the significance of that first, first line that sometimes we skip over, but, but it proclaims, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. One voice is not enough to proclaim my great Redeemer's love for me. So as we sing, let us sing with that kind of, of understanding and that, that bold statement of faith in Jesus Christ as we join our voices together. sisters of Christ and go this day and every day in the certainty of forgiveness and grace. Share that truth with all who will listen. May peace be with you until we meet again. <laughs>